Well, happy Sunday, everybody. Happy Palm Sunday to you. Welcome to Church the Online Experience. I'm so glad you checked us out today and you've joined us. If you're a member of our church, welcome, welcome. So glad you've tuned in. If you're a first time guest, thank you for checking us out. We hope you're blessed by everything you see today. Uh, today we're gonna enter into worship in just a few moments in song, and then I'm gonna share a message entitled, His Hand Was On It. Man, I'm excited for the worship and the word today. My advice to you, if you're sitting at home or you're somewhere else, that you would engage with the service. Come on, God was meant to be engaged with. So why don't you lift your hands and sing the songs? Why don't you preach with me? Shout amen at your TV, even if nobody else is there listening. I preach with nobody in the room, so you can amen with nobody in the room. Anyways, let's go now to worship. Good morning, everybody. We're excited to worship God with you in your home. We're singing about a great God. There is nobody like him. Hallelujah. Sing with us. There's no God like you. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Sing, there's no God. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no God like Jehovah.
Amen. Praise the Lord. What an awesome worship time we've had this morning. I am not afraid. Man, I'm so excited that today, wherever you're at, you don't have to be afraid either. No matter what you're going through, no matter the storm, no matter the trial, you don't have to be afraid, not only because God's in control, but God's given me a word for you this week, and His word is that His hand is on it. God's hand is on it. In fact, that's what I want to preach to you today. I, I want to preach to you from this subject, His hand was on it. You know, this past week, I've been getting used to this new normal where we have to social distance from one another. I was in the supermarket buying my groceries, and I noticed that they put up the plexiglass at the cashier stations. And I've got to say, it was really awkward at first to have a conversation with the cashier because there was a physical barrier as well as a social barrier that was creating a distance between us. I talk to the same cashier almost every time I go into, in there. I know her by name. I know about her. I know her. But it felt like something was off and something was awkward because there was a distance. Kind of like the fact that I'm preaching to you right now, and for me it's an empty room. It's a new thing I'm getting used to. It's my new normal for now. Earlier on this week, on uh, past Sunday, actually, after I got done preaching, I was talking to a friend about how crazy all of this is, how weird it is to try and get used to this social distancing. You know, if, if you go into a room and you touch something that somebody else has touched, you have to go wash your hands. Uh, you can't hug anybody. You can't embrace anybody. You can't shake a hand in case you catch the virus. And I understand why we're doing it, and I, and I applaud our, our officials for taking good care of us in their measures that they've put in place. But I got to tell you, it's, it's taken some getting used to, and I, I got to admit, I'm still not quite there. But I was talking to a friend, telling them how I was working on getting used to all of this. And I said, you know what, I don't know what God's up to with all of this, but I think that His hand is on it. And man, I got to tell you something, as soon as I said that God's hand is on it, Something hit me, kind of like electricity. I felt what I can only describe as the presence of God. And I felt like I, I got a little anointed when I said that His hand is on it. Man, I felt like I could preach this thing. And I didn't think to preach it. I just kind of let it go. But then all week long, I can't get away from this sense that God's hand is on it. Every day I've gotten up and, and, and it's been nagging in my spirit. His hand is on it. His hand is on it. His hand is on it. And after a little while, I got to thinking again, man, that'll preach real good. God's hand is on it. So I got my Bible. I got my Bible right here. and I began to look through all the places in Scripture where God's hand was on different people. I got reading through the Old Testament and through some of the New Testament. You know, God's hand has been on a lot of people throughout history. Been on the hand of prophets, been on the hand of teachers, been on the hand of preachers, been on the hand of men and women. God's hand has even been on people who didn't acknowledge Him or serve Him. So I wanted to know, what's the deal with God's hand on people? Because the truth is, God's hand being on something is only significant if you understand the significance. And in Scripture, when we read that God's hand was on somebody, it is in reference to three possible things. I want to give you those three things today because I believe that God has revelation for you today an impartation that He wants to give you if you'd receive it. The first thing that we get when we get God's power, God's hand is His power, excuse me. We'll get God's power on our lives, and, and that's amazing, God's power. But then there's another implication that we will get His hand of provision. And then the third one is His hand of direction. Now, when I was writing this all out, I thought, you know what, I'll start with provision because everybody wants the provision of the Lord we want to know how to how to have God's provision in our lives we ask God and we pray prayers like God would you please provide for me would you please bless me what we're really asking God is for him to give us of his resources we read scripture and we sing songs about him he's a healer and he's able and he can deliver and he can restore and he can set free uh, come on somebody all these things that God can do and after all of that, we get it in our mind that that's what I'll ask God. I'm going to ask God to do those things. So I thought maybe I'd start with God's provision or, or maybe His direction. How many times have you prayed, God, would you order my steps? Would you direct me? 
Hey, some of you that don't even acknowledge that there's a God, I wonder how many times have you prayed, God, if you're out there, or God, if you're real, show me. We want to see God's hand. But I realize that I can't put God's provision first or God's direction first until I first experienced His power. You know, when Jesus is getting ready to go away, leave the earth after he's been resurrected. By the way, shameless plug, next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. It's going to be the strangest Easter that I've ever been a part of, but I can't wait to preach to y'all next Sunday morning. Jesus, as he's getting ready to ascend to heaven, he's having a talk with his disciples. And he says to them, First of all, he gives them a mandate. He says, I want you to go and I want you to preach my message. I want you to tell everybody about me, the works that I've done. I want you to tell them about the gospel. I want you to tell them about salvation. I want you to baptize them. I want you to make disciples of them. But then he says, he says, but I don't want you to start yet. In Acts, the book of Acts chapter 1, he says, I want you to wait until you've received power. Now, this is interesting because Jesus has just said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And he's imparting what he has. But then he says, I still want you to go and wait until you've received power. What's that about? Well, in the New Testament, there's two words in the Greek for the English word power. One word is the word dunamis and one is the word exousia. Dunamis kind of sounds like dynamite. And that's what that kind of power is. It's the power or the ability to do something. Exousia power, on the other hand, is the power of authority to do something. I think of it this way. The dunamis power is the, the gun that a police officer carries around with him. Now, he probably has taken courses. He's learned how to use it. He knows how to fire his weapon. He knows when to do it. But a police officer has something else. He has a badge. And the badge represents his authority to be able to discharge his sidearm. Now, if he discharges the sidearm without having the badge or having ever received the badge, then even though he has the ability to pull out a gun and shoot, doesn't mean that he's done it lawfully and within his authority. And so when Jesus is saying to his disciples, go and wait until you be endued with power or the dunamis, he's saying, go and wait until you receive the ability. He says, I've already given you authority because all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. And what I have, I give to you. But I want you to wait until you get the ability. Because if all you have is the authority, but not the ability, you're going to mess things up. It's like a mechanic, for instance, that has the right paperwork that says that he completed school and is able to work on your car. But if he wasn't really paying attention in those classes... Maybe you don't want him working on your car because he may have the authority of a license, but that doesn't mean he has the correct ability to be able to work on your vehicle. And so Jesus says, I want you to get the power, the ability, not just the authority. Now herein is a struggle because a lot of us tend to find ourselves in this balance of trying to learn how to operate our lives only witnessing God's hand of power. I already told you we want to see God's provision. We want to see God's direction. We want to see God make a way. We want to see God heal people. We want to see God use us. We pray prayers like, God, use me. Here I am, Lord. I'm available to you. By the way, a lot of people don't have a clue what they're praying when they pray that prayer. You just wait. You be careful what you ask the Lord for. But we often will experience the hand of God's power, which is he'll give us the ability to do something. In other words, even though you may not recognize it, I know somebody's watching me right now and you're thinking, well, I'm not a spiritual person. I'm not a God person. I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't experienced God's power. I promise you, you have. If you have the ability to work with your hands, that's the power of God. If you have the ability to think in, in mathematical terms, that's, that's a power. I do not have that ability. I am not mathematically uh, capable. I don't, I don't have the capability to sit down. Now, I can do basic math. Don't get me wrong. Come on. Uh, I know that 2 plus 2 equals 6. I'm just kidding. I know it's 3. 4. I can't do math on a, a highly technical level, but some people can. They're the people that become engineers. I don't have that capability. I don't have that power, but perhaps you do. Perhaps 
You have uh, uh, this, this ability to write. And, and so you write, you, you write stories or you write scripts on the back of napkins. You doodle on the back of napkins. But what happens is oftentimes we will get frustrated because we may have ability to do something, but we don't have God's provision, His open door, to be able to go and operate in the ability that we have. And so we, we can get very frustrated very quickly if we don't see God opening doors. We say, well, God, I, I know how to do this. I know how to do that. Why don't you open a door so I can do it? I think about the preachers out there that are watching me that nobody else knows you're a preacher yet. Nobody else knows that you can do it. But God knows that it's inside of you. And you're frustrated because you don't have a platform. You don't have a stage. You don't have an audience. You don't have a pulpit. All you've got is the Word of God, and it's like fire shut up in your bones. And you want to preach, but nobody's given you an opportunity to preach. And you're frustrated because you've experienced the power, the ability, and perhaps even the authority, but you haven't yet experienced God's provision. Herein lies the goodness of God, because God will not give you more than you can handle. And he realizes that if you haven't learned how to be a steward of the ability that God has given you, if you haven't learned how to be faithful when all you've got is fire shut up in your bones, when all you've got is doodle sketches on the back of a napkin, when all you've got is great ideas in your brain, if you don't learn how to be disciplined and faithful in that season, then God will not give you more than you can handle. He will not give you open doors that will take you further then you are capable of going. And so sometimes all we experience is the hand of God's power and we get frustrated because we want more and God's saying be faithful where you're at and then you'll see the more. It's only when we begin to operate within the parameters of God's power that He's given to us that we can begin to see the open doors of God's provision in our lives. All of a sudden, when it happens, God will begin to bring things together. And I know some of you are frustrated because things aren't coming together yet. That's okay. Just because you can't see it the way you want to see it does not mean that God's hand is not on it. Just because you're still waiting to get that call for that job doesn't mean God's hand is not on it. Just because you're getting tired and frustrated with your kids doesn't mean God's hand is not on it. Just because you've tried everything you know to do to get your relationship back on the tracks doesn't mean that God's hand is not on it. I believe today that God's hand is very much on your life, just maybe not in the way that you see it. But once you learn how to steward power, God's provision will come on your life. And all of a sudden, even when you come from nothing, even when you have nothing to give and nothing to offer, all of a sudden... God begins to open up doors for you that you couldn't have opened up for yourself. He begins to provide resources for you that you could never have gotten by yourself, no matter how hard you worked or how hard you tried. All of a sudden, people will come around you to support your vision. And even when it looks like the odds are against you, you serve a God that will sit you down and prepare you a table in the presence of your enemies and cause your cup to run over until you have more than you could imagine. So don't get discouraged by your lack of resource. Don't get discouraged by the fact that people may not see your value and your worth yet. Don't get discouraged by the fact that nobody's calling you back. Don't get discouraged by the fact that you're still preaching to empty rooms. I need you to be encouraged in the Lord today. I need you to know that even when you cannot see it, God's hand is on it. Even when you can't feel it, God is working on your behalf. Even when all things look like they are against you, God says, I am with you and I am for you and I am going to make it happen for you in due season because my hand, God says, whew, my hand is on it. But here's the deal. Once the provision of God begins to flow and start flowing in your life, and you begin to see that hand of provision, here is a very dangerous place. And the reason a lot of people don't ever witness God's hand of direction is because they get tripped up in the area of God's provision. There's a man in your Bible by the name of David, famous man, wrote a whole book, book of Psalms, and then some. And he said this, he said, God, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, God, don't let me get so poor that I have to beg, but also don't let me become so rich that I forget about you. 
And a lot of times, once we start experiencing God's hand of provision, we make the mistake of thinking that God sent me resource to build my own kingdom. When the truth is, uh, all things work together for the good uh, to them who love God, who are the called according to His purposes. You have not been called to build your kingdom. You've been called to build His kingdom. You've not been called to build your dream. You've been called to build His dream for you, which, by the way, is greater than anything you could ever imagine. God's plans for you are far beyond what you could imagine for yourself. Don't get tripped up when you begin to see God's hand of provision on your life. That's not where you were meant to stay. You were meant to experience the third thing, which is God's hand of direction. Because when we get it in our hearts that I'm not building my kingdom, I'm building His kingdom, then all of a sudden we begin to operate differently. Perhaps you would have done it this way, but when you begin to see things God's way, you'll do it like this. When you think you'd go over here, God says, why don't you go over there? When you think, uh, I'm going to take this contract, God says, why don't you take that contract? When you say, I'm going to invest in this person, God says, uh, that's not the right relationship for you. You better not do that. God will begin to show you His ways when you learn how to steward His power and His provision in your life then you'll begin to see that His ways are so different than our ways. The way that God operates and the way that God thinks is so different than us. And sometimes we try to put our lives at a premium and we forget that the only premium that there is is the premium on Jesus Christ and the work He's done for us at Calvary. He's the only one that really makes a difference. I know some of you find yourself in different stages in the game. And the trouble is we never see God's hand in the moment, or rarely, if ever, do we see God's hand in the moment. But it's only later that we see God's hand. I remember times that I had been so sick and God has healed me, and I wondered why I went through that. But I see now, I didn't see it then, but I see it now, God's hand was on it. I think about times that I didn't have money to pay my bills, and I wonder what was God up to then. I didn't see it then, but I see it now, God's hand was on it. I think about a time I had a relationship that was hanging in the balance. Somebody I loved very dearly. And there was a lot of hurt and a lot of pain that came out of that. And I didn't see it then, but I see it now. God's hand was on it. My first year of university, I almost flunked out of my first year. I didn't see it then, but I see it now. God's hand was on it. I didn't make my high school soccer team and I really wanted to. I didn't understand it then, but I see now God's hand was on it. See, if I would have made that team, I would have had to play Sundays. It very likely would have taken me out of church and taken me out of the presence of God, but God's hand was on it. I'm going to tell you all things work together for good. Even the disappointments, even the habits, even the hang-ups, it all works together for good because we serve a God whose hand is on it. When I, I, when I was a boy, I used to preach to my stuffed animals. I didn't know it then that I was going to be a preacher someday, but God's hand was on those moments. There was a job I got turned down for a few years ago, and it crushed me. And I didn't see it then, but I see it now. God's hand was on it. Hey, I don't know where you're at today or what you're going through, where you're watching from, but I sense that somebody is frustrated in the place that you find yourself in. You're frustrated that things aren't moving faster. You're frustrated that you're not where you thought you would be by this time. You're frustrated because you can't see God in this. You can't see God's hand of protection. You can't see His provision. You can't see what He's doing. But I've come to tell you that when they lied about you, God's hand was on it. When you lied lost your job, God's hand was on it. When you put yourself out there and got rejected, the hand of the Lord was upon you. When nobody knew you and nobody saw you and nobody was calling your number, God's hand was upon it. When nobody believed in you, God's hand was upon it. When your dream was just a dream, God's hand was upon it. When nobody would give you a chance, God's hand was upon it. When you suffered abuse, 
abuse at the hands of the people that were supposed to love you. God's hand was upon it. When you were so tired that you thought you were going to faint, God's hand was upon it. And I know some of you are thinking right now, why would God let me go through what I went through? I want to tell you that nothing that you've been through has been wasted. That every step of the way, God's hand was on it. No, I don't believe that God sent every bad thing your way. But I do believe that when the enemy came along and tried to stick his hand on your life, God came by and put his hand on your life and what the enemy meant for evil and what the devil thought he would use to take you out. God turned it around for your good. God turned it around for your favor. And I've just got to tell you that even if you don't see it yet, sooner or later, it's going to turn in your favor, baby. Sooner or later, you're going to get what you've been praying for. Sooner or later, you're going to see the hand of God where you didn't see it before because his hand I said his hand I said his hand was on it hallelujah give God a praise bless his name because his hand was on it whoo I got to thinking about Jesus there's a man who had the hand of God on him as a boy Jesus is born in a stable God's hand was on that that wasn't a coincidence that his parents couldn't find anywhere else to stay that night, God's hand was on it. God's hand was on it when Jesus was found in the temple as a boy, talking to the elders and the scribes. God's hand was on it. When, when Jesus grows a little bit older, we don't read all the teenage years that Jesus had. As far as we know, he just hung out with his father, making furniture. Jesus wasn't born to be a furniture maker. He was born to be king of kings, and yet God's hand was on that moment. Nobody saw him. Nobody heard him. He wasn't doing miracles that we know of. He wasn't preaching sermons that anybody was hearing, but God's hand was on it. When Jesus does his first miracle at Cana of Galilee, God's hand was on it. When the power of God begins to fall and he begins to open blind eyes and unstop the deaf ears and, and make the lame to walk and the dumb to talk and even raise people from the dead, God's hand was on it. And as I was preparing to preach you this message, I got looking at the last week of Jesus' life. Today is what would we normally celebrate would be Palm Sunday. It commemorates the day that Jesus enters Jerusalem one week before his death. And all the people are crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're having a praise party. They're throwing down coats before him and they're throwing down palm branches before him and they're crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And I read that and I thought, what a celebration. God's hand was definitely on that. But my thoughts on God's hand got a little bit more distant the further on down the Holy Week that I read in my scriptures in the Bible. See, on the last night that Jesus is with his disciples, he has what we call the Last Supper. And there's a lot of confusion. But I even see God's hand in the confusion. Jesus goes to the garden a few hours later and he begins to pray so much so he's so, he, he, he's so vexed in his soul. He's, he, he's at such a, a painful place in his, in his life, in his ministry, that he's sweating drops of blood. But he ends up praying, nevertheless, not what I will, but thy will be done. Because again, he has not only tapped into the hand of God's power and the hand of God's provision to do miracles all through his ministry, but he has now tapped into the hand of God's direction and he realizes that he, his direction was straight to the cross. But herein lies the challenge for me as a preacher. When I begin to look at the text, I begin to look at the cross because at first, I'll be honest with you, I saw the cross as a problem. The second last thing that Jesus says on the cross is, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It appears as though God's hand is nowhere to be seen in that moment. And I recognize that this is problematic because a lot of you have been in a similar place where you have been at your wit's end. You've been between a rock and a hard place and you don't know what to do. 
and you have prayed every prayer that you can pray, and you have praised, and you have worshipped, and you have given in the offering, and you have gone to church, and you have tried to be a witness, and you've done your best to live your life for Christ, and you've done everything that Scripture tells you, everything that the preacher tells you to do, everything that you know to do. Some of you who aren't church people, you've tried to live a good life and do everything that you know to do to be good, and yet it still hasn't worked out for you, and you think, okay, I'm at the end, and God's hand isn't here. I'll be honest with you, when I first read that crucifixion story this past week in studying, I thought, this is a problem. God's hand isn't here. Why would Jesus say, why have you forsaken me if he wasn't forsaken of God? But the more I prayed on it, God began to show me that his hand was on that moment. Because Jesus, some, at some point between those words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And his last words, he had a revelation that it's always been in the hand of God. Because the last words that Jesus will say before he takes his final breath is this. He looks up to heaven and he says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Did you catch that? Into your hands I commit my spirit. Jesus got the revelation then that what I need to do is I need to put it back in the hands of God. That's the only place I can be is in His hands. That's the only place that I can find safety and security. That's the only way I can sing the song that we sang a few moments ago, before me, behind me, always beside me, I am not afraid. The only way you can sing that with boldness and true confidence and faith is when you know you have yielded your whole life into the hands of God. And here's the promise. John 10 and 27, Jesus speaking and he says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Did you catch that? When you're in the hand of Jesus, when you're in the hand of Almighty God, and when His hand is on it, there's nothing that can take you out. No flood can take you out. No fiery trial can take you out. No burning building can take you out. No sickness can take you out. No depression can take you out. No virus can take you out. Come on, somebody, hear me. There is nothing that can take you out of the hand of Almighty God. You may suffer in your flesh. Jesus did on the cross. You may suffer in your body. You may have problems in your mind. But I want to tell you what, God's hand was on it then and God's hand is on it now and right now today I know you don't see it but there will come a day that you will look back on this day and you are going to say I didn't see it then I didn't see it on Sunday April 5th 2020 on Palm Sunday in the middle of a virus when we couldn't leave our homes we couldn't go to the church to worship I didn't see it on that day but but I sure do see it now God's hand was on it Hear me, somebody, God's hand is on it today. God's provision is on it today. God's direction is on it today. God's power is on it today. I know you don't see it, but it's there. And you will see it one day. My God in heaven, I'm just praying for you. If you feel at the end of your rope, I want you to tie a knot in the end and hold on. Because you are going to see the goodness of God. His hand has been on you before you were even born. Baby, your problem isn't the flesh. Your problem is in your spirit. You need to yield that thing to Almighty God. Your problem isn't what you're experiencing down here. Your problem is being in communion and relationship with Him. You need to do it again, to pray again, to worship again. Listen, I know what I'm saying. I know you're saying, preacher, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. Do it again. Reach out to God again. Ask again, you're going to see it, His hand. Hey, if you're not in relationship with Jesus, you are never going to see His hand. If you want to see it, the best place to start is to be in relationship with Him. You start, your first step is to repent of your sins today. Tell the Lord, God, I'm sorry for my sins. I am a sinner. I am in need of your grace. I do need salvation. 
Ask him to forgive you. I tell you what, he will forgive you. He is not far from any of us. He is close. If we will call on him and call on his name, he is close. He's close to you today. I know you don't see his hand over here, but he's close. I know we don't sense his hand, but he's close. When you've done that, you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. If you've never done that, today is a good day to do that. And when you've done that, God promises. He says, I will fill you with my spirit. I will give you the power. And once you get God's hand of power on your life, it'll only be a matter of time before you'll see his provision and you will see his direction in your life. Hey, I want to pray for you today. Some of you are upset. Some of you are frustrated. Some of you are anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't be afraid. God is with you. God is for you. I know the enemy might be messing up some things in your life right now. Some of your plans have been messed up, but God is still on the throne. God is still working. Father, I pray today for the person that's watching me over the web. God, maybe they're not even watching me on the day that I'm, I'm speaking the message. Maybe this is years down the road. This is weeks down the road and they're watching this. But God, I believe that your presence and your power can transcend time and it can transcend the video waves. It can transcend the airwaves. And right now, God, you can minister to the person who finds themselves not being able to see your hand in it and wanting so desperately to see you. They so desperately, God, you said that we would see you if we would keep our hearts pure. Blessed are the pure in heart. Oh, for they shall see God. Lord, we cannot see you if we don't stay pure in our hearts. So I'm praying right now God uh, that you would help us to keep a right spirit to keep a right attitude uh, God to not not go crazy in this time of a pandemic God but to to hold on to the truth of your word to know God that even when we don't see your hand it's there it's present it's an unseen hand but I believe it's guiding and directing us today Jesus I pray you just bless everyone that's watching in Jesus name I pray well, that about concludes our Sunday online experience for today. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Before we go, we want to give you the opportunity to join with us in giving. If anything you've heard, anything you've experienced today has blessed you and you want to let God know by giving back and sowing into God's kingdom financially, you'll find an instruction on the screen below you how you can give to the ministry that God is doing in this hour. It's exciting times and we are blessed to be a part of it. Hey, if you are like me and you enjoy spending some time in prayer after you've digested the Word of God, I'd like you to check out the link down below to our online worship playlist. There's some songs there you can go and listen to and you can spend some more time just worshiping God and spend some time in your own home seeking and pursuing God. Finally, I want to let you know the next Sunday is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And as I've already mentioned, it's going to be a strange one, I'm sure. I don't think I've ever not been in a live service on Easter in my life, but it looks like this may be a first. And so either way, we're going to be coming to you live right where you are, and we are going to bless you. I believe the service will bless you, the music, the preaching. We're just going to have a wonderful time. So tune in next Sunday, 1030. Can't wait to see you. Also, almost forgot, we're online here tonight at 6 o'clock. We're going to be singing live. Send in your requests if there's something you want to hear or something you want to see, uh, and, and we'll do our best to accommodate you. Hey, thanks for being with us today, and until next time, God bless you.